What do you do when somebody's refusing to wear a mask or wearing the mask below their nose or complaining about the new rules or trying to shake your hand or violently coughing and hacking up a lung, eek, uh, or wearing a fake mask or taking off the mask when you're not looking, congregating in large groups, going around barriers, doing, being a COVID cop, mask shaming, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When I first started working on this training, I assumed that the way this training would be set up, it would be, you know, if they do this, then you do that. If they do this, then you do that. But that's actually not what the research says to do. The research basically suggests an approach that basically you have one approach for all of these problems, which is, makes it a lot easier to remember. And that approach is built in this tool that is in your workbook. So please print out this tool, laminate it, put it by your desk. Pretty much all your COVID problems, you're going to use this tool. And it's based on the idea that the research says that when trying to get people to follow public health measures, there are three different types of people. So let's walk through those three different types of people one by one. Number one, are people that basically agree with the rule, they just made a mistake. They forgot. For example, this is my family. Uh, that is my wife there, Chrissy. Uh, she is a seven-time cancer survivor. She is immunocompromised about as much as they get. And she went into a Panera last week without a mask. Not because she's against masks, but because she forgot. She just made a mistake. So she ran back out to her car, got her mask. No big deal. What the research says is that working memory capacity predicts social distancing during COVID. So there's actually research around this, that when our working memory capacity is diminished, basically... When we're overwhelmed, we make more mistakes, which I think, generally speaking, everybody's more overwhelmed than they are normally, thus they're more likely to make mistakes. And while this training is not explicitly around homelessness, I do have to put a no little note in there that homeless individuals, the research shows that actually they have more compromised working memory capacity because of all the stress of being homeless, making it more likely they're going to make these types of mistakes too. So have a little empathy for people they're going to make mistakes right now, even if they agree with the rule. That's the first type of person. The second type of person is someone who neither agrees nor disagrees with the rule. They're not against it per se. They're not for it per se. They just don't want to be inconvenienced. So they don't want to be bothered. Going back to my family, the uh, handsome gentleman there, that is my son, Cameron. He is 21 years old. He is not against social distancing. He's not against masks. He's not against w limiting where he can go. He just really wants to go to the gym. He really doesn't want all these inconveniences of COVID. He is smack dab in that second group, which by the way, I think the vast majority of people, a really sizable chunk of the population is in this second group. They neither agree nor disagree. They just don't want to be inconvenienced. By the way, again, pointing out homelessness because that's my expertise. Uh, homeless individuals, I think, are largely in this group because, for example, I've been mugged three times this year. I mean, if you've been mugged three times in one year, guess what? COVID does not scare you. Which brings us to this kind of weird uh, paradox that homeless folks are actually super, super high risk for, for COVID, but COVID is relatively low risk for many homeless individuals because in the grand scheme of the risks they're taking, freezing to death, starving to death, getting mugged, COVID's pretty low on the danger level compared to the others. All right. And then the third group of people is people who they actually disagree with the rule because it conflicts with their values and they will fight for their values. Let's spend a little bit more time on this group and kind of break it down. There's kind of three areas of values where this plays out. Number one is politics. Not to get too political, but there is research around this, so I'm going to stick to the research. And what the research says is that Republicans social distance less. But so do Democrats that live in a state with a Republican governor. Huh. And how they know this is they, um, they use cell phone data because most of our cell phones now have a GPS, and so we can actually track where people go. Um, and so this graph here, uh, represent social distancing. So blue is Democrats, red is Republicans. That red line is when the state enacted social distancing policies. So what you can see basically is that Republicans kind of kept doing what they were doing and Democrats social distance more. Uh, further looking at the research, um, 
One article said the virus is being framed with different levels of lethality to, to distinct political audiences, meaning it matters where you're getting your news. If you're getting your news from a more liberal news outlet, it's framing it, COVID, as if, oh my gosh, it's going to kill everybody. I'm exaggerating a little bit. On the other side, if you're getting your news from a more conservative uh, news outlet, it's kind of framing it. It's like, oh, it's no big deal. It's just basically the flu. Again, exaggerating a little bit. Uh, but basically, where you get your news politically dictates how dangerous, how serious you think COVID is. And here's why that is so important. In the last Ebola outbreak, uh, when they were studying containment measures, the biggest factor of whether someone complied or not with, uh, with what they're asking them to do was how serious that person thought Ebola was. If they thought it was super serious, way more likely to follow the, the protocols. If they thought it was less serious, way less likely to do it. And again, that links up quite interestingly with what the research says about lethality and politics. Number two, orientation to authority. Regardless of your political orientation, some people just don't like being told what to do. Some people are really, really, really sensitive to tyranny and their independence and their freedom, etc., regardless of where they are on the political spectrum. And so that is going to come in as a factor with getting people to follow your policies, your rules. And then finally, conspiracy theories. Uh, I wanted to give you a lot of research here. There's a ton of research around conspiracy theories. I will stick to a couple of the most key points when it comes to conspiracy theories, what the research says. Uh, first one is, this is fascinating. There are certain factors that increase the level of conspiracy theories in a community. For example, more, the more stressed people are, the more likely they are to turn to conspiracy theories. The more social isolation, the more conspiracy theories. The more people feel powerless, uh, the more there is crisis, the more there is uncertainty, and the more there is economic decline, the more people turn to conspiracy theories. Wow, look at that. Like, basically, that is the like, COVID coronavirus playbook. In fact, like basically, you couldn't design a scenario that is more conducive for conspiracy theories than what we're living through right now. And what that means is have a little empathy, have a, you know, give a little bit of grace to people who are, have given into conspiracy theories. The conditions are ripe for conspiracy theories. So maybe cut people a little bit of slack. Next piece, uh, and this is important for how you respond to people with, uh, who are, who are spouting off conspiracy theories, the backfire effect. The backfire effect is super, super important with conspiracy theories. Basically what the research says, when people who believe conspiracy theories are asked to verbally respond to contrary information, i.e. basically someone tells them the truth and engages them in an argument, it actually strengthens their beliefs. So the more you try to fight that conspiracy theory, the deeper entrenched, the more they believe that conspiracy theory. Eek, and we'll come back later, we'll talk a little bit about what to do instead of uh, fighting people about their conspiracy theories and thus actually helping them to solidify that belief in your mind, in their mind. <clears throat> All right, so those are the three different types of people. Now, what's fascinating is that it's not that everybody falls into one of these three camps and that's who, who you are for the rest of your life. You can actually change. So one day you might be in the neither agree nor disagree. Another day you might be in agrees with the rules. Another day you might fundamentally disagree with them based on kind of what's happening in your life, what your mood is, whether a friend got sick, etc. People actually are malleable in this. And so it's not like you just flag a person once and for all and you're done. It's a little more nuanced than that. Um, furthermore, you respond to these three different types of people differently when you're trying to get them to follow the rules. So people that agree with the rule that just made a mistake, they just need a reminder. People that neither agree nor disagree, you need to make compliance more convenient than not compliance so that they just, they'll just follow the easiest route. And if the easiest route is following your rules, that's what they're going to do. If the easiest route is to not follow the rules, that's what they're going to do. So you're going to make it easier to follow the rules than not. And then this last group, the people that fundamentally disagree with the rules, the key to them, oh, sorry, go back to this last group, the uh, neither agree nor disagree. Um, they don't have to agree with the rules, you just want to make it compliant. So, like, for example, if they wear a mask that says, I'm only wearing this mask to get in the store, great, cool beans, just wear the mask. I don't care if your mask proclaims that you're only wearing it because you want to get in the store, fine, wear the mask. Okay, and this last group, 
this last group who disagrees with the rules, you're going to try to change their behavior without changing their values. The research is crystal clear on this. It is really, really hard to change somebody's values. It is much easier to change their behavior to kind of go around their values and change their behavior without changing their values. For example, if somebody wants to wear this mask, I prefer dangerous liberty over peaceful slavery. Great. I don't care. Go ahead and proclaim your independence while you're wearing a mask. Okay. So those are the three different types of people. What's fascinating though is that these three different types of people lend themselves really well to a three-step model. Step one, step two, step three. So basically what I'm saying here is when you first encounter someone who's not following your COVID rules, you're going to assume that they're the first type of person, that they agree with the rules, they just made a mistake. Then if they start to fight you, you're going to assume you're going to move into step two. Now you're going to assume that they neither agree nor disagree. They just don't want to be inconvenienced. And if they still fight you, you're going to move into step three and assume that they disagree with the rules because of their values. And you use different tools, different uh, strategies, depending on where you are in this three-part model.